in an endeavor to try to set a, path, a uh, model for other people in the future. Uh, my philosophy is that uh, you can either stumble ahead, one foot ahead of the other in life, or you can keep your eyes on the stars. You can dream dreams of a better world. You can tithe for humanity. And uh, I learned that uh, from my father and also at Nuremberg, prodded by my wife, who had a needle in my back. Uh, I, she, uh, I, I, I set sail for Nuremberg. And I arrived in Nuremberg in March of 46 in a blinding rainstorm. Walked across the uh, Grand Hotel, which was be my home, and uh, for a year and a half there, and uh, didn't sleep that much that, that night. But following morning, I walked through the ruins of Nuremberg, and there was nobody there, no human beings there. There were a few old women with shawls, black shawls, depressing, and no food. And I said. Uh, as I walked to the courthouse for the first time, I'm going to dedicate my life to the prevention of this. And uh, I since have dedicated my life to it. Got at the courthouse. I had no supervision whatsoever. They said prepare cases against von Brockitsch, who was commander in chief of the German army, Guderian, who was uh, chief of the staff of the German army and Erhard Milch, who was head of the German Air Force in, under Goering. But uh, I just, Nuremberg was geared to self-starters. And if anything, I am a self-starter. And I didn't like supervision anyway. I had too many, <laughs> I had too many layers of supervision in the middle, middle bank firm. There was a junior partner and a junior and a senior associate and this and that. And by the time anything got done, it had been watered down, so it didn't mean as much as I wanted to mean. So there's certain satisfaction. But when I saw the crimes, I worked on the human experiments case, saw what Dr. Rasher had done at uh, Dachau concentration camp. I, I saw the slave laborers. We had witnesses from the slave labor, which was the largest slaving operation in history. Nothing even remotely like it. And uh, I also met some of the defendants uh, with Herman Goering. Uh, he was very entertaining to talk to. He, he was quite a raconteur. And uh, for some reason, it was a Saturday afternoon, the last time I saw him on September 28, 1946. Uh, we spent a couple of hours hearing about the gossip between Hitler and Ciano, who he hated, the Italian foreign minister and minister. Middle East son, uh, Mussolini's son-in-law, and uh, Hitler. But he was an unconstruct, recon, uh, unconstructed, uh, uh, he was not a reconstructed Nazi. He was a person who believed that Hitler would come back, that there would be a return in 60 years. But I also met Albert Speer, who was the uh, Minister of War Production, whom I wrote a book about. And uh, uh, I had, uh, prepared a case against Erhard Milch, who was uh, a chairman with Speer, the leader of the Central Planning Board, which governs Germany's economy in wartime. And uh, I tried to get tes uh, testimony against uh, Milch from Speer. Uh, he didn't have any uh, uh, testimony he wanted to give me. He said, I'm responsible. I was the chairman of the Central Planning Board. I take responsibility for it. So I've got a dry hole. In other words, in the oil industry, that's bad. So I had to make conversations with him. And uh, so what happened was that uh, I saw that he was drawing a picture of a woman with a black shawl uh, sitting on a park bench uh, looking into a dark sky. I said, who's that uh, picture of? He says, it's my mother. I said, why is she so depressed? He says, because I'm here. So uh, 
I told him that uh, I thought the painting was very good. My mother was an artist, and uh, so was my mother-in-law. And uh, he s I, s I got talking with him, and I said, you were the one who influenced Hitler more than anybody else. And I said, how did you do it? He said, well, every Wednesday night, I took the night plane about 7 p.m. from Temple off Airdrome, and I re 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 pre-dialogued my conversations with Hitler. And uh, I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, let me give you an example. Uh, Bormann, who was a party chief, wanted to destroy all the ins industrial installations in the Low Countries and in uh, France, and he, I didn't want it. And uh, so on the way down from the Tempelhof Airdrome to Berchtesgaden, where I had a meeting with Hitler, I, I, did, I con conceived of a plan for handling the meeting and for destroying Bormann's objective. When I got down there, per my pre-rehearsal, pre I told Hitler, you have this directory, which directive, which Bormann has asked you to sign. You don't want to sign that. We're coming back. You told us we're coming back. And Hitler rep ripped up the directive. So um, Speer intrigued me a great deal. Uh, he was the only one who pleaded guilty. He said, I'm responsible. He's certainly no hero. He did some terrible things. But uh, I learned a lot at Nuremberg and uh, uh, through uh, Speer and many other people, well, particularly on the prosecution staff. What I'm saying is this, that I'm in the autumn of my life, perhaps the late autumn, I don't know, although uh, I hopefully uh, have a few years left. But as I look on it, Nuremberg was the most meaningful part of my life. And I don't say this in a selfish sense, but we have to sell young people on the idea that it's the substance it's the concern of your future persons that are going to be here on the planet. It's concern of a world in which weapons don't destroy man. We want men to control weapons. That's the important thing. Again, back to my first premise. I think you got to keep your eyes on your star on the stars, and you live on hopes. And let's keep that ideal in the future. We have a special responsibility because we're a free society and a society where dreams can become a reality. We have the American dream, which becomes a reality in the business world. Let the American dream become a reality in the international political world. Thank you.